Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thursday, August 24th, our final day of WolfCon. Yeah, let's get a good morning. Good morning. Uh, we got a couple of uh, items to work through this morning. And um, there we go. So featuring the illustrious president of the Open Library Foundation, Tom Kramer, uh, fully decked out in regalia um, at our reception last night. Uh, did those of you that were at the reception, did you have a fun time? All right. On to more fun stuff is uh, the Wolfie Selfie Contest of 2023. It is 2023 right now, right? Um, First of all, we had a few shots of Wolfie about town or about campus uh, and uh, enjoying the sights. Um, Wolfie had a grand old time. Uh, and then Wolfie was uh, participating in the conference as well. Um, and uh, Wolfie was at the reception and had a blast. Uh, still a little bit sleepy looking uh, from last night. And, um, but there were many uh, pictures posted uh, to the formerly, the site formerly known as Twitter um, and other places that we found. And we've got some winners to announce for this year's selfie contest. Uh, the first is Uh, and so if winners could come up, if any of you, if any of you in this picture, we've got uh, um, Anya Arnold, Jesse Jensen, and or Heather McFarlane. Um, there is a prize for you to divvy up amongst yourselves or Anya, since it's your picture, you can make the call on that. Um, and there is not just one winner in the Wolfie Selfie Contest. <laughs> Laura Daniels, please come on down. Um, this was uh, Wolfie co-presenting with, with Laura and uh, Wolfie's gonna be a cataloger pretty soon. And uh, last but not least, just this morning, Maura Byrne, uh, Lynn Fors and Don Tadero, uh, having a nice walk this morning by the looks of it. Hopefully it wasn't too hot for you. So come on down, any of you that are able. Yep. Come on down. It's... Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, I'm gonna pass things off to Tom Kramer for a moment and Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, the crowd is appropriately warmed up. This is great. Uh, so welcome to day three. For some of us, it feels like day four or day five, but I feel the energy still building. So I, I think the peak is coming. Um, this is just for, uh, this is our last time together, though many of us are still here all day today and many of us for much of the day tomorrow. Just want to again, give out a special recognition and a thank you to the organizations and the people that have made this possible. So for all of our sponsors, for EBSCO, our platinum sponsor, for our hosts, uh, so wonderful at the University of Chicago, for Arlef at Colt Ex Libris, Index Data, MeScan, and Knowledge Integration. Thank you very much. This conference literally would not have happened without you and without them. So if we could just get a round of applause. So uh, secondly, running a conference like this is basically a thankless task, except for the very beginning and the very end of this conference. I really want to call out, uh, this is why I had to step in and, and take over from Jesse, because he could not thank himself. Um, the volunteers that are up here made this happen. And I wanna first of all, thank everyone in the community. This is a community meeting. This is for you, for everyone who is here, for everyone who is online, for everyone who has presented, for everyone who has participated with questions. Let's give everyone, all of us, all of you a big round of applause.
so uh, for Paul, for uh, Kristen, for Sharon, and for Damien, thank you in particular for being the, the, the herders, the wranglers for the overall conference and for each of the communities. There are a few people I really want to call out, though. So about six months ago, called up Jesse and said, hey, Jesse, what, what you doing this summer? And he said, well, I don't know. Why do you ask? And then we told him he didn't say no. Jesse, thank you so much. He stepped into the lead and the entire program. It has gone amazingly smoothly. It's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Todd Olson is in the back. Uh, we were similarly looking for hosts and University of Chicago did not say no. Um, Thank you, Todd. Thank you, everyone at University of Chicago. It's, you've been lovely hosts. It has been a fantastic area. The weather's eh, eh, the weather on Monday, Tuesday, and uh, some of yesterday was was lovely. Um, uh, Rachel, who you've seen, Kate. Yes, Rachel, uh, Kate, Steph. Uh, where's Steph? Steph over here. Uh, Beth, who is not here today, they met with Jesse, with Todd, with a few others. They carried this entire event through for the last four to six months, just making sure that all of the logistics were lined up, that everything came off. Uh, Steph has told me several times, it's amazing how well people think things are going because they can't see all the stuff that's going underneath the surface. Thank you all. You have been fantastic. Uh, and then well, there's one more person to see who you will not see until every single video goes up and gets posted online that you've seen invisibly throughout. Peter Murray is standing in the back. Uh, I was talking to someone at the bar last night and Peter, they said, I don't know how Peter does it. Uh, he can do an ultimate, he's busy wrangling AWS costs and making sure the Folio project can actually afford to keep going. And then he's busy uh, unplugging dongles and making sure the capacitors run out so people can actually present. He's truly someone who works at all levels. Thank you very much. I think that is the last slide, but we have one last special event. Um, many of you may have seen, and they don't know I'm about to do this, and I'm going to get guff. Um, Kirsten, could you come down here for a second? Yeah, you. Kirsten kemner Heek and Todd, would you mind coming down for a second? Uh-huh, uh-huh. No, this is going to be good. It's going to be worth it. This is completely unrehearsed. Um, many of you may have seen the flag. It was in the, in the selfie contest, which that wasn't a selfie technically because Rachel took it. Um, Last year, I think this is one of the beauties of being in an international community is there's different cultures have different things. I have learned that flags are a thing in Germany. So last year at, could you take one half? And Todd, could you take the other? Um, we had, uh, we spent about a year and a half lining up for Hamburg last year. And for those of you who were there and Kirsten was part of an incredible team that helped pull that off. Kirsten really insisted in a very quiet but uh, repeated way that we needed a flag. We got a flag. None of us on the organizing committee knew exactly why we needed the flag, but it looked beautiful. And then we were clever and said, let's not put a date up. So here is the flag for this year. We couldn't get a flagpole, um, but we do have the flag. Um, so Kirsten representing last year's amazing hosts and organizers, Todd representing this year's amazing hosts and organizers. There is a spot right here for next year's host and organizer. We're gonna Photoshop them in. If you would like the opportunity to bring the world to your community, to your local stop, if you would like the opportunity to bring lots of your staff so they can get trained, exposed, and immersed in the, the international WolfCon community, let us know. We are looking to go to Europe next year, go back to Europe, and in two years, we would like to come back to North America. There is someone here who is thinking about this, and they're going to come talk to me or one of the other organizers and say, yes, you know what, this sounds pretty exciting. So take your spot on the flag, and uh, hopefully you will we'll hear from you before the end of today while you're still enthusiastic. And now we're going to jump straight into uh, Beyond Mark, Future Proofing Your Library, uh, uh, the panel.
Okay, so I'm taking, I'm putting on a linked data hat. Uh, you can't see it, but it's got three corners. All right, uh, so uh, one of the reasons that many of us are interested in open source and uh, community-driven or market-driven solutions is the ability to redefine what our environments might be and to determine that capacity ourselves. Um, Mark is such a lovely, lovely standard, and at 50, 60, 70 years old, it really is a veteran. But maybe in 50, 60, 70 years, we won't still be talking about Mark because we'll have evolved beyond that. And today, I'm very pleased to be uh, moderating a panel on Beyond Mark, uh, Future Proofing Your Library. And with us today, we have uh, Matt Miller from Library of Congress, uh, Gloria Gonzalez from EBSCO, and Alvaro Lopez Bustamante from the University of uh, Concepcion. Uh, each of them are going to speak briefly about some of their efforts to wield the power of open source software and drive innovation and help introduce the power of linked data into our bibliographic ecosystem. Um, so with that, Matt, you're going to come up and you're going to start with uh, five to seven minutes. We will have uh, a period of questions after this and uh, with time allowing some Q&A. So if you've got brilliant questions, uh, you can be prepared. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't have any slides, so I'm just kind of going to go through my little talk here. Um, so thinking about kind of the history of BitFrame at LC, um, I've been kind of in like a historical mode recently because back in DC, we're actually moving offices. We're moving from one building to another. So we actually have to be like out of the building by next, um, by the end of the month. So like there's a lot of like activity and a lot of like um, crates, moving crates everywhere, you know? And it was funny, I was talking to this, to um, Sally McCallum, who's our chief of our office, and she was saying, she was pointing to some crates and she said like, oh, I need to go through those. Those are like um, some memos and reports uh, made by um, Henriette Avram about the original Mark standard, you know? And so it was, it's kind of interesting to think about like the, the history of institutional knowledge, like when it's like visualized for you, you know, it's like a bunch of crates and like how many crates do you need to hold your institutional knowledge? Um, you know, and then like drag them across the street to another office. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of like the history of Mark and Bibframe, Bibframe, you know, is a much fewer of those crates because um, it's more contemporary, but it still has has had a lot of, um, you know, years put into it. And I thought it'd be nice to just kind of briefly review some of those um, kind of milestones and just kind of talk about where we started and then now where we are now. Um, so, Going back to 2007, there was an initial meeting called the Future of Bibliographic Control. And like two main points came out of this meeting. One was like, we need to do better jobs with authorities, distributing them, getting them out there more, and then we need to move away from Mark. And um, the, the the first part of that about authorities um, kind of um, started being resolved with the introduction work on id.loc.gov which started in 2008 and it was started off by just serving LCSH headings as linked data. And so I, I really think of ID as like a precursor to BibFrame because, you know, you have to have links to do linked data. And so, you know, if you look at ID today, there's a huge number of vocabularies on there, lots of controlled mark lists, even, you know, all the libraries, resources in BibFrame in works and instances, just a ton of data on there. And so, um, you know, having that work continue is kind of ongoing, but in 2011, it was kind of officially announced, okay, the library is interested in working on a new bibliographic framework, which became BibFrame. And um, that kind of resulted in work and meetings and um, some, and just like, I'm kind of opening up one of those crates to tell you about this because I wasn't there, you know, in 2011. Um, but, you know, the that we got help from uh, Zafir and Eric Miller to kind of design a model. And, um, you know, in, in our office, we're very kind of focused on like learning through kind of doing, you know, like you can make an ontology and plan all you want, but until you actually like have putting, you're, you're putting metadata into something and trying it out, you're not going to learn anything. And so in 2015, we started a pilot. And so this pilot most importantly involved a number of catalogers, a lot of catalogers who would be cataloging um, you know, they would do some work in Mark. They'd also do that same work in BitFrame to kind of learn about how how things should work. 
And this pilot, which went from 2015 until um, a couple years ago, or last year, really sort of dri drove a lot of development in bib frame at LC. And so you can imagine all the sort of things you need around kind of developing this sort of new framework. You need converters, right? So you need to go from Mark to bib frame. But also, if you want a round trip, you have to go from bib frame back to Mark. And so that was important for the library. So that was developed as well. Lots of changes in, in developments in editors, you know, so that was the work mostly I was involved in is editing, you know, how do you edit stuff and how do you improve that experience? And then, you know, um, uh, you know, there was also kind of times, uh, events, things like the LD4 grants that we got involved in that really helped spread the, the notion of BibFrame um, in a larger community and, and really sort of um, expanded the, the, the participation. So um, that kind of leads us up to pretty recently where, um, you know, we had initially thought about like, okay, so if we have this editor and we have this conversion, we can kind of slip our, 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 our records back into the ILS. And that would be kind of the, the sort of completing the, the loop of our, our kind of um, bit frame editing. Um, but then the decision was made to, to adopt Folio and the decision was like, you know, to make a bit frame a major component of that. So that's kind of to where we are today. And so it's it's very kind of exciting to kind of see how that can kind of continue in this pretty, you know, over a decade long history of progress towards, you know, of, of the BitFrame standard. So I think I'll pass it over to Gloria. Thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, Matt reminded me of a story that I heard um, just recently when I was in D.C. Um, from Sally McCallum at the Library of Congress, um, who's the, the head of Matt's division. Um, and she was telling me about a time when she was here at the University of Chicago uh, listening to Henriette Avram speak. Um, so we are carrying on a long history of uh, talking about emerging standards at this university specifically. So Henriette was there talking about this new standard called MARC, and she was starting to encourage libraries to start thinking about new ways to exchange their data. So Sally was really inspired by this talk, and she came up to Henriette after, and she said, can I work with you? Which led her to go to the Library of Congress and dedicate her career to improving the MARC standard, making the MARC standard uh, widely adopted, and now Sally is focusing on bib frame and making bib frame um, easier to use and, and more widely adopted. Um, so I thought you all would like that story. Um, and a little fun fact, uh, Marva, the Marva editor that we're building that Matt has been working on for so long, um, that is Avram backwards. So that's that's where Marva came from. And it is, it's also marvelous, but it comes from Avram. Um, so fast forward to 2011. Um, I'm an intern at the Library of Congress. Um, I was greenhorn and very excited, and I was working on some projects, but I got a little bored. Um, so I went to my manager, Bill LaFergy, and I asked, um, hey, like, can I have some more work, or is there something else I can do? Um, and he said, have you heard of this thing called linked data? Um, so this is 2011, I, I hadn't heard of it, and I said, um, I can learn. So I was tasked with writing blog posts and learning from people at the library. Um, and what that did was set my career on a whole trajectory that, that led me here today. Um, so I, I later, a few years later, left my job at UCLA, my secure library job, to work for a startup. So I believe in moving beyond Mark so much that I sacrificed my student loan forgiveness. Um, so I really need I really need you guys to make this happen. <laughs> I really need you to do this with with us. Um, and so when I started working for that startup Zafira, um, they had just finished making the model for the Library of Congress, the initial bib frame model, and we were focused on uh, making it easier for libraries to adopt linked data. Um, so we reached out to some visionaries, um, and I'm excited to see Robert Roos here from the library from Spokane Public Library because he was one of the first 10 customers that came to us and said, we are willing to put our money into something that doesn't exist, which at that time was libraries showing up in Google search results. Um, and it was a long journey. Um, but now when you search for books in the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia, you find your libraries near you and all those books, and it's become normal. 
Um, and we've seen a huge adoption of linked data in, in public libraries. And at the same time, we saw leaders like Stanford and Cornell um, and others working in the LD4 area. Um, so, you know, we're, we're continuing this large arc of linked data adoption. So later on in 2020, I joined EBSCO um, when they acquired Zafira, and I got to work making it even easier for all libraries of all shapes and sizes to start adopting um, linked data. Um, so there I work on Folio, but I also work across all products to teach people at EBSCO um, how linked data can integrate into everything. Um, and in 2022, I started to work with way more Folio libraries. And that led to me um, meeting Alvaro at the University of Concepcion um, and uh, speaking to people who were already uh, dedicated to open source and open data. Um, and I found many more visionaries in this space. And talking to you all, I can see that you can, so many of you can see the future that I can see, um, but you're in institutions where you are maybe are under-resourced or you're experiencing budget cuts or you've already gone through a massive amount of change. Um, so when I ask these, the, all of the visionaries I met here, like what are the biggest things that are preventing this from moving forward? Um, I hear fear of change. Um, I hear, I heard a phrase, and this is new to me, hatred of change. Um, so I have a slide. I, forget, I do have a slide. Um, so, we, you know, when you're afraid, one thing that helps is uh, knowing that you're not alone. So um, I have recently been very inspired by the, um, the open science movement. Um, I've, I've included a link here um, from a recent event uh, that was hosted by the Center for Open Science that explains their theory of change. Um, and I think this provides a really logical structure. Um, we need to make it possible with Folio and make it easy. Um, but we will not be successful unless we have wide community adoption to make it normative. And we learn um, in every region what are the most rewarding things that we need to focus on to give libraries the motivation to change. Um, and then, of course, we need the policy. Um, so we need to have people understand that you have to change the rules so that you can also um, kind of control the change a little bit um, and make sure that um, maybe um, 30 years from now, we'll be talking about the next best thing. Um, so that was just kind of a quick overview of, of my work with um, adopting linked data, and I'm excited to talk to everybody. So I'll ask Alvaro to come up and speak of his work. Okay. Hi. Um, well, I'm I'm going to talk about um, our process uh, implementing uh, BigFrame in our institution, and then um, about some considerations about the the future. I will try to make it quick. It's only four slides. <laughs> <laughs> I have seven minutes, so <laughs> there we go. So, um, we're um, doing this uh, transformation in what I like to call uh, three stages plus two uh, model. That means that uh, we have three uh, elements. It's, this is resources, rules, and users that uh, are applied or considered in a consecutive or kind of consecutive way. And then two stages that are permanent which are transformation and training. So, so and resources involves uh, first and foremost mindset change because um, you gotta change the way you see at uh, well at a um, bibliographic description. Uh, it's not the same to to make um, a mark record than uh, be, a different resource because uh, the, the approach is totally different. And uh, you need to change that. That's the, the, the first uh, uh, task. Then you have to um, make an analysis of uh, mark versus B-frame uh, to see um, 
what are B-frame requirements and what do you have in your in database? And then you have to diagnose your database authorities, uh, bibliographic records, and see the state your databases are. Uh, <laughs> that's a hard part. Uh, and then um, you start to overlap with the rules because um, you need to make a standardization of your records in order to make the change. So uh, at the same time, you have to uh, develop new rules, like transitional rules from Mark to BFRAME, because it's not the same because the, um, the approach is different. Um, the approach is uh, towards the users. So there you start to overlap also with the user approach. Also, you, you need to um, make an assessment of your inner databases, because in our case, we want to, to connect with um, uh, Dublin Core databases, and uh, we need to not make a, an assessment. And uh, this overlaps with the user interface and the user experience, um, because uh, in the end, that's what uh, linked data and BFM is about, about the users. Uh, they need to find information. So <clears throat> these, uh, these three stages uh, are in a kind of consecutive way because they overlap, but you need to always being, uh, make a transformation from Mac to BFrame to generate linked data in order to um, uh, evaluate every time what are you doing because um, you need to make change and see what happens because it would be like kind of foolish to change everything and then find out that you messed things up. No, that's no good. <laughs> and then um, you need to train your team on the different concepts and on tools and systems. Okay, next slide. So um, doing this, we found out uh, new librarianship roles. Um, so very quickly, it's um, user experience because uh, that need to be assessed permanently. You need a, a curator of knowledge because you need quality control on your external sources. And on the same line, you need someone uh, to take care of authorities because you need to check that. And uh, as a lot of stuff uh, has to do with external uh, institution. You need someone in charge of uh, external liaisons. And um, well, as AIs are almost here, because um, I guess, I don't know if everybody uh, has seen uh, ChatGPT uh, making like mark records and stuff. So it's almost there. And pretty soon they'll, they'll, well, catalog in a massive way. So you need someone to supervise that. It's not that we are all going to die and we are <laughs> we've been losing our jobs. It's not like that. We'll change roles. Okay. So um, <clears throat> about AIs and uh, linked data, um, I. Uh, I think that um, a phenomenon called emergence will happen, will occur. Um, emergence, um, it's when um, uh, a quality that is not apparent at the micro, at the small level, uh, appears at a macro, at a bigger level. For instance, um, you have a, a bird and a flock of birds, they behave differently, they have different qualities, or for instance, one cell is just one cell, but if you get together billions of them, you have a human being, it's different. So um, we think that uh, this might happen um, in three generations or stages um, where a lot of AIs will be working together and there will be a lot of linked data and a lot of institutions. So um, we think that maybe 
uh, will have uh, in a very, very short feature, uh, an autocomplete button for, for cataloging, maybe batch cataloging, of course, and uh, AI aided uh, standards. In the second stage, um, we'll have, uh, I guess, a more efficient resource description based on RDF, based on AI, and um, we'll be able to to ask um, the machine in a natural language a question such as, uh, oh, find my paper on Isaac Asimov for my research, and uh, it will find it. And also interaction with uh, AIs, AI such as uh, Alexa, Siri, and whatever. So resources will be closer to, to users. And in a third uh, stage, um, well, possibly will be a total interaction and searches will be, will be through uh, objective-based AIs. So that means that um, you ask the AI to for something and it will find it. Uh, and you won't have to tell it how to find it because that's how objective-based AIs work. So in other words, that will be like a, a universal library. And this will be based on fully automated and self-actualized data banks. And this, I think, this might lead to invisible technology. What does it mean? Because, um, for instance, um, this is invisible technology because um, this is a uh, a very complex instrument that uh, many people doesn't know how it works, but it works. It's invisible the way it works. And finally, I, I don't know if I'm on time, um, what are, this is our uh, institutional projections. We want to integrate with our inner databases when, that are based on this space, OGS, and Dataverse, Atom, we want to connect with external databases, uh, for instance, LC, Wikidata, BIAF. We, we uh, intend to enrich our catalog with uh, images, video, audio, and whatever appears, I guess, and uh, implement uh, knowledge panels, collections, and uh, any other application that, uh, that might appear. Um, this will lead, and to something that we want. Uh, we want to position our library or institution through Google. And uh, we also want to research an uh, algorithm uh, feeding on social media. So our institution is suggested to users. And um, on top of this, to spread uh, academic uh, production, because that's uh, our justification that's that's how we will be able to say uh, hey we are doing all this investment and this is the result and uh, i want to end with um uh, a phrase but uh, abraham lincoln uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it thank you All right. Alvaro, I've never seen that quote before. That's fantastic. Also, thank you for skipping over the remainder 37 slides. So we have time for some awesome uh, questions and answers with our expert panelists. We've heard from three people who are not only theorists and uh, in linked data and working to bring about the future, but who are also practitioners. So Matt, you talked about the history of um, the history of Mark and working with catalogers looking towards the future, but rooted in the past. You're developing Marva, uh, so it's a new editor from scratch. What are some of the joys and some of the challenges uh, as you're undertaking this? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I think for any sort of metadata editor, it's all about like user interaction, user experience, and of course, you know, making it accessible. Um, I think when you think about like data, sometimes you think of like sci-fi, like you're like grabbing the air and like pulling things together or something. But it's like most power users or you know catalogers or power users want like a spreadsheet. So I think um, combining those two ideas of like, so now we have BibFrame, it's it's more complicated than Mark in the sense that there's like data types and all these other things. And it's like, how do you make that into an interface that's basically, you know, the most productive interface someone could have. 
So I think it, there's there's a lot of challenges ahead, but there's also like really good opportunities to kind of explore that space and really kind of rethink about what we want um, like an interface to manage metadata to look like in the future. So yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Thank you, Matt. Um, so Alvaro, uh, you've talked. Yeah, it's in my head though. Um, Alvaro, you've talked, you obviously, you already have uh, plans and you've done laid a lot of the groundwork at your institution. Uh, you're adopting Folio and waiting for Marva. Can you talk about what some of your plans are to uh, help predict the future by creating it? Oh, okay. Um, well, we want to, to implement fully a bit frame and uh, we want to explore uh, AIs basically. And then, um, well, um, also after that, um, we want to, to help to spread um, these new technologies in our uh, geographical area, like in Chile and South America. That's mostly it because uh, all other stuff is technical stuff and uh, we can solve it uh, in one way or another, but uh, the, the real challenge is to spread this in, in South America and Latin America. Thank you. Um, Gloria, you're working with EBSCO, with University of Concepcion, with Library of Congress, and with the community. What are you hoping to see develop between now and, say, the next WolfCon? Um, so in the next year, I would love to see more people get hands on their own linked data. Um, I strongly believe that the, the fastest way to learn is to get your hands dirty, to see what your data looks like, and to, to find those practical use cases. I think, I think Matt echoed that a lot. Um, so I will be working with Alvaro and the Library of Congress, of course, but we also need to share and get as much input from others who are ready to start looking at their data, too, so that we can ensure that what we're building for the Library of Congress can be widely used by the entire community. Um, and um, I, I would also in encourage and love to see the community um, not wait for their data to be perfect before you start experimenting. I get a lot of like, well, my data is messy um, and things like that. And I'm glad I'm glad that Alvaro touched on AI because our data in libraries, we've always known how valuable it is. But today it's even more valuable because it is created and curated by humans. Um, and we will see that value skyrocket over time. I work with big industry players in, in other areas and they salivate over library data. Um, so I would love to see people get brave and, and jump in and, and start seeing what their data looks like. All right. Well, thank you very much. So maybe a question for each one of you. Um, uh, the We have uh, resources, rules, and tools uh, might be a, a redaction of one of your slides. Folio is coming on live. Marva will be live. Uh, what do you see specifically happening in the Folio community in the next two years to advance linked data and BibFrame? Yeah, I was thinking earlier about, you know, like successful adoption of standards or even tools, something like IIIF, where there's a standard, but there's also very great, you know, impl implementations of that standard. Um, so I was, it's really exciting for, for having Folio come along because it's, it's going to we have the standard, but most places have been doing their sort of like, sort of like their own thing, you know? And so having this platform come and having a lot of people, a lot of eyes, a lot of uh, kind of thoughts about it looking at this platform and big frame in it and developing on it, I think is like really exciting because it's going to really drive forward big frame and, and the adoption of it. So that's what I'm most excited about looking forward to is, you know, what happens at the scale and, and then the, the sort of like um, things that are, can kind of come from operating at that level. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to learning more from all of you about the full ecosystem that you want to, to see over time, um, because as we move further beyond Mark, we'll see a lot of different um, services pop up and they'll have really good uses and you'll be able to mix and match them, um, but you'll have to figure out what they are, how they apply to your workflows and how you want to see those in Folio. 
Um, so that implies applies to Library of Congress that has its own ecosystem as well as as other libraries too. And we'll see that kind of vary from region to region. Um, so I think to make adoption successful, we have to get a better picture of what are we connecting to, um, to pull in data into Folio to make work less redundant, um, and where are we sending data to, what are all the discovery layers, um, because you don't have just one, you don't have to just send it to one place, you can send it to many, many places for, for different purposes. Um, well, I think that, um, well, I, I have the pers the perspective from um, trying to make a big frame come to life in in our institution, um, and I would love I, I um, that the folio in the next two years could be totally fully uh, linked data and big frame compliant, compliant, and that would be great. And uh, also, I think, uh, yeah. Um, folio on the community that uh, um, will make a, a very, very uh, big effort. But uh, also I think that um, outside, uh, we also need to, to be aware of, of that. For instance, we need um, a discovery service that are fully compatible with uh, B-Frame, for, for instance. And um, I think that um, folio will be growing more and more, I think uh, they, that BPRINT will be implemented fully. And um, that's it. Uh, I think that uh, with Folio, we can see um, the results of a concerted community effort. Uh, it's great. And I think uh, if the community keeps on working, um, Folio will will still be the one of the strongest ILS in, in the market. All right, thank you, Alvaro. Uh, so are there any questions from the audience? Really? All right, thank you. Uh, Jesse has agreed to run the uh, microphone. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, that you'd like to see or you'd like to hear from the community, you know, how, how they'd adopt it. Um, but where, like me, where can I keep informed about what developments there are so that when we're ready, we can at least speak up? That is, that's a great question. Um, so there was previously, um, for a long time, the entity management working group, and that's where the conversations were happening. Um, recently, that's folded into the metadata management SIG. So that's the the, the go-to place um, to, to get updates, to ask questions. Um, you're also free to work, uh, to reach out directly to any of us. Um, and is there, do you have any other places maybe? Okay. Jeremy has his hand up. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, uh, I, I see DSpace uh, on the integration line up there, and I'm just thinking as I'm uh, uh, bib frame, about, like, and, and in, this is really of you guys. Um, I'm interested in like, the integration between BitFrame and other common representations of linked data in the library space. Specifically, we use Fedora. So, you know, you have the LDP thing going on there. Are there any interesting things in, uh, yeah, the intersection between, you know, uh, alternate representations of linked data like that? Oh, lucky. Oh, uh, well, um, to me at least, um, it's like a very weird stuff because uh, everything um, becomes or JSON LD or becomes XML. So it's like uh, it's kind of weird for me because like everything can can connect with everything. So uh, anything that that you can <laughs> that you can imagine that uh, is expressed in XML can work with this. So. Uh, so far, we haven't found uh, anything like uh, that interesting, but um, we are we are aiming to connect everything inside our, our institution. So you'll need 
like one search bar and uh, that's that's it that's all i can say yeah so i'll just add that um the the approach that we took when designing um the solution that we proposed for the library of congress um was focused on providing a foundation for linked data just linked data and then, of course, we have the the centeredness on the bib frame model in the Marva editor in the profiles. Um, but what you'll get is a graph based storage that you can extend um, for different purposes. So if you want to link to something else, you want to pull in something that isn't a bib frame model, you'll be able to do that because um, that's one of the best things about linked data is that you can have interoperability. Um, but for that to be successful, uh, we got to know, okay, what do you want to connect to? How how does that ontology work? Um, so the sooner we could collect, maybe that's a good like uh, task to work with with metadata SIG, um, is to figure out what other models are going to be interacting with Folio, um, so we can kind of get ahead of those challenges. Yeah, I would just add, you know, during our, our pilot at LC, we would kind of approach this problem where, you know, we started off with monographs, but there's, you know, we have a bunch of other application profiles based on media types. And so, you know, we would have, you know, original 35 millimeter print films and what do we need to do to kind of add things to the ontology to make those catalogable or integratable. So I think it's just, you know, we're going to start kind of at the baseline and like Gloria says, and like expand out, but yeah, that will be kind of an effort to kind of expand to things very complicated, like serials and other sorts of more complicated metadata for sure. All right, we have a hand up with Owen and then Simeon towards the front. Yeah, I think that actually my question to some extent, you you maybe it's the same answer. I, I my One of my areas of interest is electronic resources and the way those are packaged and working with what are termed knowledge bases. So generally not marked data, but other ways of describing those resources with focus on particular aspects of of um coverage to enable access and i guess i was i i guess that sub, to some extent i think you know what you've just been saying about it being a linked data platform and identifying those things is is important if you have any other thoughts about those areas specifically i'd be interested but also uh to say not just metadata sig because there are other places where which don't fall under the the usual cataloging responsibilities in the library, but are absolutely core to the library service in terms of describing resources and access to those resources. Um, so yeah, please come talk to ERM and others as well. Uh, that's a that's a great point, and I'm glad you brought this up because my friend Zorian over here, uh, who's my go-to person to learn about e-resources from, reminded me. I've been beyond Mark forever. He's like, we 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 don't deal with that. Um, so yes, there's definitely um, other places where where we can connect. Um, I will add uh, so something that you might be. I know that you touched on um, during your talk on the open access app. You talked about like Crossref and a few other external sources. Um, those are things that we could streamline through the same approach that we're building through the Library of Congress to help you pull data into that app. Um, and then also you might be interested in um, once you're, you're, you have your data um, in, in this format, it becomes much easier to compare graphs. Um, so if you wanted to look across institutions and see like, okay, what are their overlapping holdings or what, what journals do they have that are the same, um, those things become much more achievable um, in linked data compared to a traditional knowledge base. Simeon Warner, Cornell University. Um, this is a great panel, and I am truly excited that Folio is blazing the trail toward being a mainstream ILS fully supporting linked data. That's very exciting. One of the futures that I'm slightly concerned about is the idea that we end up treating linked data in our little local islands separate from each other rather than sharing descriptions at a broader level. I'm interested in the panelists' thoughts on both the social and technical infrastructures that might be necessary to have a more shared future in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we libraries have had a long history of kind of collaboration and sharing of records and stuff like that. So I think this technology just could perhaps make that easier to do. So I'm, I'm, 
I could see that a future where it does become siloed in a sense, but I think the nature of of how it, the data is and how it's kind of approached would make it easier to kind of find more ways to collaborate and share more. So yeah, I don't know what model that would be like federation, you know, one central thing. It's it's hard to say, but like I I think we're in a much better position with this to to kind of move towards that vision. I would love to ask you the same question. I wonder what your answer is. Um, so I, I've been thinking a lot about this um, and um, it's going to take brave conversations where we're candid about what we wanna do, what we don't wanna do. Um, I mentioned earlier, like one of my concerns about talking to libraries is not everybody has the same amount of resources. Um, some are more funded than others. So we need those who have the money and are ready to step up and have massive graphs of data that they want to share with as many people as possible to do that. Um, and then we'll have other institutions that will pull from from those data sources um, that we'll see evolve over time. Um, and that's the kind of like cooperative approach that I think would work really well. Um, but I would love to learn from from you, from from Stanford um, and others to because um, I think Alvaro said this, it's not a technical issue. it's it's all social. Um, so we have to remember that we all have the same goal in mind, uh, not get our feelings hurt and just figure it out together, I think. Well, I think that uh, we are in, in the dawning now of a new era and um, it's very good. We're in a, in, a, in a very good position to make a, um, such a, uh, decisions because um, the management of inf information right now is based on libraries, you know, institutions. It's it's okay if, if you, can, you can manage that. But um, the, I think that this will spread like wildfire and um, it won't be just uh, library, so to say, information. It won't be only in um, documents related with research. It will spread on everything. So that, as Gloria said, uh, in, will involve uh, decisions that will be ethical, political, social. So uh, since we are at the beginning of this uh, process, we are in a privileged position to, to make changes and to set up uh, directions. That's it. Okay, so I think Peter, if I'm reading his pantomimes correctly, has indicated there is a question in chat. Uh, will these slides be available in SCED? Oh, that's an easy one. It yes. looks affirmative. Yes, they will be. And Lucy is going to sneak in the last question for this session. <laughs> but And Jesse's up there, but he's a distance runner, so we're good. <laughs> so I've been sitting here sort of thinking how to how to frame this question and maybe it's not even a question but building off of what you just said over about it, it's going to spread like wildfire I think some of this spread is going to be beyond our control and we're going to be playing catch up to it right so for example just to use one one example of something that I think AI is going to be pretty easily able to do in the future a, a researcher summarize this article for me and get me copies of all of the things that are in the citation list right just deliver them to me. Now, what's the role in the library in that? Well, if our data is you know, on the web, it's discoverable, but then what's the next step? How does the researcher get it? How do they get access to that electronic content? How do they get a copy of that book? AI can't handle all of that. We just need to enable it somehow. And I feel like if, we, if we're not thinking about that, somebody else is gonna come in and figure out how to do it for us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Clap, please, please, please. Yes. No, that's definitely a concern that when I saw what Chat GPT could do, I was like, oh no. Okay. So um what's what's interesting though is um I know that libraries can lock into all of these apps and services that are based on generative AI using graphs um, and putting actions on top of it because we just did that with Google. And that's just one example of a, basically a use case of like, find it at a library near me. You give it any information, it knows what you're talking about, and then it tells you where to get it. 
Um, so that's, I know we can recreate that with, with Folio and with our data, um, but we need to find the right people to talk to. We have to find what we want to integrate into first, um, and we can't uh, really waste too much time. <laughs> Um, but what's great, what I've learned in my early research over the last few months is that um, with linked, using uh, linked data together with language models can make them more efficient. It can make them um, easier and more affordable to run because you're essentially limiting the, the data set that you're training things with. Um, and most importantly, you can provide trusted information from the institutions that will give you what you need versus um, a fake book name about segregation in the 1960s um, that will get you in trouble <laughs> if you turn in that, that citation. Um, yeah, of course. Um, we need to change the, the roles uh, for librarians. It's, it's not the, the, the same role that we had in in the past century, this is very different, and it has to do more than with um, retrieving information. It has to do with what you, what are you doing with information? Um, um, what tools do you, do you have to interpret that information, and uh, how do you help people to um, get the best of the information they they, they get? Uh, it's very different, and it's a much more active role, and um, it's a change of perspective. Very very, it's a very sharp change of perspective. All right. Well, I would, uh, with that, I, I really liked Alvaro's slide on what the future looks like. I think those of us who've been working in linked data for a while know that the technology is not actually the hard part. It's the rules and the expectations, the fear and loathing or the hopes and dreams um, that we have to wrestle. I would say that however we're organized right now, the metadata management SIG in the Folio community is a great place to start, but that's not where all the work is going to happen. And I very much hope at this conference next year, a, um, linked data is one of the main tracks, maybe AI too, which I almost said, uh, but linked data is one of the main tracks and we see new structures, uh, new capacities, as well as new tools and tons of progress from all the panelists, as well as those in the audience. So with that, can we give a round of applause and thank you.